let us begin a discussion on gene cloning. So I know when you hear cloning, it has a negative connotation because people automatically go to cloning of people and other organisms. But cloning can also be of a genetic sequence. So we can clone a gene. Okay, So, you know, imagine a single gene on a chromosome in a cell. And the first part of this cloning is we have to isolate that gene out of that cell. And then when we do, we can use a process to make multiple copies of that same gene, that small genetic sequence of interest. Okay, But now how in do we do it? So this idea of gene cloning came about in the 1970s. And like I said, you take one small piece of a chromosome and you just copy it over and over and over again. Why do you need to do this? Well, one, if you wanted to sequence that DNA, the process takes multiple copies of the sequence. You can use gene editing to go in and mutate the genes and then figure out what that mutation caused, you know, sequence and function. You can use labeled DNA strands as probes, specifically in identifying RNA in northern blotting, which will be a subsequent sequence video. You can also express those clone genes so that you can figure out their function or purify them within a cell or use it for like insulin and bacteria to make, to make a lot of insulin, to make transgenic species or for gene therapy. So the uses are almost boundless, but it requires that we isolate these genes and make lots of copies of it. So two ways we're going to discuss on how to make copies of genes. This video is on gene cloning by a vector, and then the next video will be about gene cloning through PCR. So gene cloning to a vector. So remember, you're finding that small gene within a chromosome, within a cell. So you got to crack open that cell, isolate that DNA, purify it. And you can use chromatography or centrifugation, which are both outside the scope of what you need to know, but those are biochemical processes that you are welcome to look up if you are interested in them. Then, like I said, this is by a vector. So you have to identify the vector that you're going to use. Now, a vector is this small DNA molecule, like a plasmid. So we talked about plasmids in the bacteria genetics chapter. Okay, so plasmids can be used as vectors. So we know that those are extra chromosomal DNA found in bacteria. Well, they have an origin of replication and they can have a selectable marker like those antibiotic resistance we were talking about. It can also be a virus. So we know that viruses can be used to insert foreign DNA into bacteria. Or there are some other things called cosmids, yeast artificial chromosomes or bacterial artificial chromosomes. And these tend to be used to clone large pieces of DNA and to make whole genomic libraries. Okay, So isolate your DNA and then choose a vector. All right, so what's going on here? So one here is a plasmid, and it has this amplisistent resistance gene as well as a LAC-Z. So these are two things that we can consider to be selectable markers that will tell us if we have, in fact, inserted our gene of interest. And then we have that gene of interest on the chromosomal DNA. We're going to cut them with restriction enzymes. What is a restriction enzyme? So these are enzymes that have specific recognition sequences. They find those recognition sequences and then they cleave the DNA. They can leave these sticky ends where there's these overhangs and then some of them also leave a blunt end. But when they leave a sticky end, then you know it's very specific in what two pieces you can stick together like a puzzle. So you treat the vector DNA as well as the chromosome DNA with this restriction enzyme so that these two puzzle pieces fit together perfectly, right? And then you use DNA ligase, and that should be something that we are very familiar with to seal the phosphate sugar backbone, okay? And so after we cleave them, now we are making the conditions optimal for these two things to come together. Well, they only come together in a small percentage of the time. So one, you can have this recirculized vector where the vector just says the heck with this and goes back to its original form. So even though it was cut, it reconnected to itself and there is no insertion of foreign DNA. You can have the gene of interest inserted. And so when that happens, You'll put this in your DNA and you'll look to see that, oh, it's amplicillin it's ampli resistant and that this LAC-Z is 
disturbed so the laxity won't it won't be produced or a random piece so remember we're cutting all of this dna with the same restriction enzyme so we're making a lot of puzzle pieces that can fit together so maybe the wrong thing goes in there so we will be testing for this stuff later okay so then we put this dna with the e coli and then we have to treat it to make it take it up so remember transformation we're trying to get this bacteria to take up these naked DNA fragments and we have to then make this artificially competent because now we're in the lab and we know that E. coli is not naturally competent so we have to disrupt the membrane and allow that bacteria to take up our plasmid then we're going to grow it on a plate and this plate is going to help us determine is so if it's recirculized then that means this lac Z is intact and it works and you're going to get a specific color if we destroy that lag Z because our gene has inserted, then you get another color, okay? And so we can take these colonies out, the ones that we are interested in, and then we know we can do other things with them, okay? And so this is the process of gene cloning. So you have two different types of DNA, your plasmid and your chromosomal. You cut both with a restriction enzyme. You hope that they insert together, you seal them with the ligase, and then you plate them to see, or you have them taken up by, by bacteria, then you plate them to see what happens. Now, there's an alternative process here. So what we were talking about was inserting DNA. There's also some instances where you can insert mRNA. And now it goes a little bit different because then you have to take that mRNA and reverse transcribe it back to DNA, okay, which in this case will be a cDNA or complementary DNA because the DNA is complementary to an RNA strand. Now, there are some pros and cons of using this. One being the process we talked about first taking it straight out of the chromosome means we have a mixture of introns and exons and it's a larger fragment, whereas here it's going to be smaller and simpler because the exons are spliced together and introns have already been removed. But that means too, we have to do something a little different. So here we have our mRNA and we know that eukaryotic mRNA naturally has a poly A tail. So the first primer that we use here is a poly T. And we know that T is complementary to A. And then we have to have reverse transcriptase to hook onto this T and then continue making DNA to match this mRNA. Then there's an RNA H which can come along and cut up this mRNA. And then DNA polymerase 2 comes in, removes these, which it sees as being primers, and then fill in the DNA, and then ligase comes along. And so now we're left with a double stranded cDNA molecule that we can then use to back to the steps of cloning where we can insert it. Okay, so cut it with, well, bind it to something else, cut it with the restriction enzyme, and then go through the same steps. Although now there's no introns included. Okay, and one thing you can do with these is make a library. So we know that we are cutting up whole chromosomes trying to get a specific gene of interest, right? But you can essentially insert these different fragments of DNA into the bacteria, you know, make more copies of them, and you can create libraries that will, like a book, you can go take out the one that you are interested in. So it's like taking, cloning every strand of DNA or every fragment of the DNA and then allowing people to go and pick their fragment of interest. So this will have great implications down the road once we, well, we know a lot now, but once we figure out more and then more things that we can do with it. So as technology advances, like really the possibilities are endless. Okay, so those are the steps. Now I want you to think about the pros and cons of these, these processes. Like what can we do with it? Can humans take this process too far? Okay, so and that's going to be the theme through through this chapter a lot. Like, okay, so we've done this. Now, what's the possibility that we can use this for? And then can it be used against us? Okay, so think about the pros and cons.